Um, a very early morning for some of you on the back benches, probably like midday for the people in front. Uh, and welcome to this first seminar day of the New Art Plus program, which is the academic or seminar debate program of the New Art Festival. So as those of you who have looked in the program knows, we have two days of these uh, seminars where we're going to have presentations from artists, academics, uh, journalists or people who write about this scene. Uh, and today the topic of the program is about utopia or create as it says in, in brackets. So what we're going to do basically today is to have Thomas More's publication of Utopia 500 years ago as a point of departure and we're going to look at uh, issues that can be uh, extended from his, uh, his work. So we're going to start off with a presentation by Professor David Pinder before we give a, have a presentation by Kenard Phillips, follow up by a Q&A session with Carla McCormick, before we go into uh, dive into three shorter presentations followed by a debate by uh, Emma Arnold, Pedro Suarez Neves and Peter Bengtsson. But you are not here to hear me talking, so I would then like to introduce the first speaker that we have today, and that is David Pinder. He is a professor at Roskilde University in, uh, in Denmark, the Department of People and Technology. So Pinder's interests lie in urban studies, geography, planning and critical theory, and his research explores how urban spaces are socially produced, imagined, performed and contested. And the title of his talk is Cities and Life as Works of Art. So welcome, Peter. Uh, David, sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Um, so it's a real delight to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. And I'm really excited to participate in this wonderful event. Um, thanks especially to, to Martin and Eric for facilitating it. And also all those who have already been really helpful, um, James, Marissa and Emma and others. So I'm really looking forward to our discussions over these two days and the chance to connect um, with a number of you. And um, what I'll do today is to talk for around 30 minutes or so and then hopefully leave some time for discussion. But also what I hope is some of what I say may be things that we can pick up on later because, um, as you'll see, what I'm going to offer is some quite broad reflections. So my talk is going to try and take up some of these core themes of today's um, programme, those of utopia and rights to the city. And I want to reflect on their relation to um, and, and reflect on them through art, initially by going back in time. Not quite as far as Thomas More, 500 years that Eric mentioned, although I'm going to be mindful of his presence. Or not quite as far as to the birth of Dada, um, 100 years, which will be particularly the focus tomorrow. Um, although my interest in the creative side of utopia will never be far away from ideas of radical negation, questions embodied by Dada, perhaps, um, in ways that I think will point to some of the themes for tomorrow. And if my reference points might take us a little distance from some of the kinds of contemporary practices that are um, worked with in this festival, I hope they might nevertheless open up some perspectives, some wider perspectives that might be useful for later discussion. And as my starting point, I want to take a remarkable exhibition that is running for a couple more weeks at the Hague's Municipal Museum. Staged in collaboration with the Sophia Museum in Madrid, it provides one of the most extensive tours yet assembled of the utopian spaces of New Babylon by the Dutch artist Constant. It's a project that he developed between around the mid-1950s and the early 1970s. And this film extract um, is, uh, sorry, in this film extract, um, the camera roams over and through some of the models that he created during this period and that now on display in the museum. Structures made from perspex, metal, wood, they intended as contributions to what he called an experimental thought and play model for the establishment of principles of a new and different culture. Many of the structures are raised off the ground, which is left free for transport. They're multi-layered, multi-coloured and form a network. 
their momentary formation of a space that Constant always imagined would be constantly in the process of becoming as it's being created by the inhabitants of this new space. And the models were just one means of exploring this new space and new way of life. Um, that prior to the revolutionary change that would enable their construction, particularly he was imagining the socialization of land, so private property being abolished, the socialization of the means of production, which would be taken into the control of workers, and the emancipation of people from alienating and uh, exploitative work. All those, he fully appreciated that in advance of those changes, you couldn't yet plan and imagine exactly how this new world would be. But this is an attempt to try to formulate, to find a, find a kind of language for this new space. And the models, I think, are still remarkable artifacts, whether appearing on film or in photographs or as experienced closer firsthand in the museum. And Constant collaborated with photographers and filmmakers in trying to find different ways of presenting these materials in lectures. They were combined, uh, and often from this immersed perspective, they were combined with drawings, lithographs, lectures, writings, and a whole variety of other means. Particularly with the drawings, the emphasis on movement, on flow, and a space of becoming becomes uh, much more apparent. Space as it's being the, the, the constantly created uh, environment of people themselves. The exhibition is called Constant New Babylon to Us Liberty, and it speaks then of this desire for an emancipated future world in which technological advancement has resolved questions of scarcity, in which urban space becomes a medium and expression of free creativity, hence my title of Cities as Works of Art. And Constant initially developed this as part of the avant garde movement that has formed a very significant part of the genealogy of this festival and remains a strong reference point for many um, artists who have worked here over the years, the Situationists. That was before he resigned from the group in 1960 and then he developed his project independently. New Babylon, he wrote, is a world of plenty, one in which toil gives way to play. He presented poetry and art here, not as individual specialist pursuits, but rather a way of life for all. And he quotes Lodriamo, poetry is made by all, not by one. And the title of this exhibition then, To Us Liberty, comes from the original title of a painting that he did when he was part of the Cobra movement in uh, 1949. But he became pessimistic, increasingly pessimistic of the prospects of change at the time and later retitled it After Us Liberty. He commented, I changed the title to express my doubts about the possibility of free art in an unfree society. And at the same time, my hopes for the freedom all people are looking for. And I'm going to come back to some of these doubts later on. Um, and surely they're greatly amplified for us today, so many decades on, when that emancipatory hope might seem much more distant. New Babylon was always a project more than a collection of individual works, a striving to imagine an emancipated future world radically different from the prevailing order of the day. And as such, it no doubt seems to emanate from a very different time when visiting the museum or seeing this uh, through these images. But what I want to do now is to focus my attention on this idea of rights to the city and to think about how this starting point might provide a way of opening up some perspectives on this, particularly um, in terms of its utopian dimensions and what that might mean for us today. The right to the city has, of course, been a widely used slogan in recent years. It's been taken up within urban studies, but also many urban social movements, people fighting for better urban conditions, particularly against gentrification and urban change uh, that's divisive and, uh, and displacing populations. It's also, in rather different ways, been taken up by many... Uh, non-governmental organizations on the international stage, United Nations Habitat uh, being one, in a rather different register, much more about working within the liberal state. The term originates, as is well known, in the writings of the Marxist, French Marxist philosopher and sociologist Henri Lefebvre, and particularly his collection of essays with this title in 1968. And the cover image here shows Lefebvre in full discursive mode, and apparently he was a, a really brilliant speaker, with the rationally planned structures of a new town 
um, behind him. And it's indeed this new town, its rapid construction from 1957, it near his birthplace in southwest France, that he credited as sparking his critical attention to urban environments. Previously, he'd been, his empirical work had been more focused on rural sociology. And it was this kind of sense that the landscapes of France were being radically transformed through rapid capitalist urbanization and new modes of planning, including the planning of the new towns on the outskirts of Paris, such as Sarcel. This sense then, um, it was this context in which he rooted the idea of the right to the city. In response to these transformations of existing cities and the building of new including the demolition of parts of central Paris and the displacements of hundreds of thousands of people through the building works, particularly working class communities, particularly those um, whose families had come from North Africa to the banlieue beyond the periphery that has newly constructed. So it's in that context then that the right to the city gets formulated with this awareness that very powerful forces are tending to destroy the city. And the right to the city becomes then not simply, and this would be really a crucial point that I, I want to, to circulate around today, not about an individual right to a better share of what already exists, but this cry and a demand, this feeling of, of reacting against and trying to reappropriate space and urban life, a, a transformed and renewed right to urban life, as he put it. So it's that transformative dimension, that utopian dimension, um, that was um, significant to him and was rooted also in his long-standing interest in that any political change had to also be a change of everyday life to be meaningful, the ways in which we relate to one another, and also to our spaces, the, the environments in which um, we live. And it was in that context that he, again in 1968, um, declares, let everyday life become a work of art. But he's very much thinking of that in spatial and urban terms. This is, um, th there's a sense in which the art is also one that's rooted in the city. Um, and in The Right to the City, he says this, and you can see how he's responding here to perhaps the idea of a, a version of public art, which is more about the pretification of spaces, which he says that's not his intention here, to put art in the service of the urban. But rather, it means that time spaces become works of art, and that former art reconsiders itself as source and model of appropriation of space and time. So art can become a kind of praxis or a poesis, it's kind of almost like a, a poetic form, but it's a collective action um, on the social scale, the art of living in the city as work of art. 1968 mentions the publication date here, and of course, this is just before the events of those years in Paris where it could be seen in some ways as realizing some of uh, what he has in mind here particularly with some of the famous graffiti um, uh, which proliferates across the walls of the city and which speak of this desire to reclaim and reappropriate the city space. So questions of participation then, uh, appropriation, and a reclaiming of difference, not as it's defined under existing social order, but the right to be different, to be able to shape one's own life according to one's own desires and to shape one's own spaces. So in this sense, he, he uses um, an, a phrase he often uses here is the idea of the city as an oeuvre, as a, as a kind of work, rather like a work of art, rather than a product which is sold to us or um, where we find a space to inhabit. This idea that it should be something generated from the body, from the collective social uh, action, from social movements. Um, and here, other famous graffiti, and I'm pleased there's a kind of mirroring here of the, of the imagery, but here the idea that this world is potentially within reach. So it was a kind of imminent critique of the situation. It's not deferring this to some far future, but the idea that through action now, we might try to realize this transformed world. And amongst the influences here are, going back to that movement I mentioned earlier, the Situationists. By 1968, his close association with this movement had pretty much, had broken apart. They criticized him for, at the time, being this kind of theorist, not being fully involved in the movements. But early in the 1960s, he was, there was a close association between them, a mutually influential one. 
in which their engagement with city space, their critical political engagement, helps to inform his thinking and vice versa. They're influenced by his critiques of everyday life. Um, the situation is today, in, often in a more mainstream debate, often kind of the, the renowned drift becomes reduced rather to a, a kind of random stroll through urban spaces, and it loses that critical radical edge that it certainly was intended to have for them. Where for them it was both the an analysis of the city, but also this attempt to live out a different way of being in the city, experimentation with forms of action which uh, go against the disciplining of space and time, finding your own space, your own time in the city, and also a reconnaissance for the contestation of city space, as seeing the city as a site of political struggle. And one book which has interesting images here as well as the text is the, their own account of the events of May 1968, published by uh, Vianney in 1968. One of the images is of a map of Paris with markings of the barricades as they went up um, on the 10th of May. And this interest here then of the, the drift or the, the psychogeographic exploration as being one about working out the points of where power lies in the city and how that might be contested um, is embodied, I think, in this image. But there's a long-standing interest also in, in uh, wall writing um, within the situationist movement, which feeds into some of this thinking. This is a famous image that Guy Debord, the, the leading situationist, um, chalked up in, in 1953, and it gets reproduced in their journal as marking the kind of minimum program of the movement, this declaration, never work. And here, this idea of everyday life being this battleground and attempt to contest forms of work as it regiments our daily lives. Clearly here, not a refusal of any kind of um, labor at all, but rather the refusal of the conditions of labor under contemporary capitalist society. And in 1968, the, the imagery from the graffiti on the walls gets reproduced in, in their account, again picking up on this idea of, of everyday life being transformed, live without dead time, enjoy without constraint. And then this image, which is evoking a very different radical history from that of the traditional left, of which they're very critical, but looks back to an earlier time when the streets of Paris were reappropriated by working people. A brief moment for 72 days of the Paris Commune in 1871, which not surprisingly for those involved in the revolutions of 68, becomes a sort of point of reference and a point of inspiration here. And it's indeed the Commune that becomes one point of contact between the Fair and, and the Situationists, where they debate trying to reinterpret this and particularly trying to reinterpret it in a way that doesn't just simply see it as already having failed. Um, it's almost like the failure is already inscribed in our accounts of it. But rather, for those who lived it, there's this opening up of possibility um, despite the bloody repression that then follows. So there's debates between them. And Lefebvre in 1965 provides his own account where it's very much this interest in how the regimentation of space and life are transformed through this kind of festival, um, an immense epic festival, as Lefebvre puts it, uh, which unfolds at first in magnificence and joy. And among the many interesting areas which, where regimentation and categories are being questioned in the commune is precisely these issues around art and who is an artist and the division between art and manual labor and intellectual labor and manual labor. And a lot of these categories are being questioned and experimented with and refused within the commune with these claims of, of equality at the very heart rather than something to be postponed, something to be claimed. And so there's interesting experimentation here with well, what, what is the role of the artist? May the barricades themselves as a creative act be seen as a work of art. Um, so images of the makers of the barricades being photographed in front of their creation, almost as if they're signing off their work. Um, and here, um, a recent account by Kristen Ross, um, which goes back to this, what she calls the um, political imaginary of the Paris Commune, 
I think, has some very interesting reflections where she's very much influenced by Lefebvre's account and influenced by Ranciere and others. Um, and is, is interested in, at one point in the book, she talks about some of these uh, debates around amongst the, the artist federations about what, how might we expand the sense of art in new ways. And she writes, the demand that beauty flourish in spaces shared in common and not just in special privatized preserves means reconfiguring art to be fully integrated into everyday life. And so you probably maybe can't see that so clearly actually. Um, but um, she quotes here the, the anarchist geographer, Elise Reclus, who um, puts it this way. He says, ah, if the painters and sculptors were free, there would be no need for them to shut themselves up in salons. They would have but to reconstruct our cities, first demolishing those ignoble cubes of stone where human beings are piled up, rich and poor, the beggar and the pompous millionaire, starvelings and the satiated, victims and hangman. And you can see here how this sort of creative act, this idea of a, of a utopian space of, of creativity, is also for him combined with this moment of destruction as well, of clearing out, of which the great symbol of the commune is the, the, this famous image of the destruction of the um, imperial monument to Napoleon, the Vendome Column, which the communards pulled down just before um, they're defeated by the, the French army reclaiming the city. So um, what I've wanted to do today by going back to some of this history is really to go back to um, a particular kind of trajectory of this idea of the right to the city, which is used in very different ways today. And um, we'll be having a panel debate later on today with other perspectives on this, and I'm not wanting to sort of um, claim this is the only way, but there's a particular reading here of the right to the city, which is one which is invested with this utopian ambition of radical change and transformation. As I said, less about uh, claiming a better share of what already exists, but rather putting into question the processes through which we make our environments and how we might reappropriate them and actively participate in that making. And thinking here about the role of art um, beyond the idea of um, a sort of decorative element, as Lefebvre puts it, but as something that's right at the heart of the, as a kind of model for this, as a model of appropriation of a kind of participatory festive encounter. Um, and to reflect on this today, though, I started with Constance New Babylon. And Constance was a figure that Lefebvre uh, came to know in the 1960s and became friends with and was influenced by. Uh, Constant himself uh, suggests that Lefebvre took something from his work, but clearly, the, again, the influence went both ways. And, um, and it's interesting, I think, to think, well, what does Lefebvre, or what do people who are interested in right to city, what might they take away now from that New Babylon project um, as it's being... Um, shown still today in museums and has become um, a kind of reawakening of interest, I think, in the last uh, 10 to 15 years or so. And one comment we might make when we're thinking about this uh, imagery and the way in which it's now receding into the background here is the way that it does seem, in many ways, these dreams and visions seem very distant. Um, utopias might once have played a very vital role in modernist and avant-garde ambitions to change the world within 20th century Europe as expressions of desire for that radical change. And indeed embodiments of this belief that artistic creativity can help build a better world. But these kind of grand visions in, in many commentaries today might seem to be belonging to the past. Their dreams of creating better conditions for all supposedly are shattered, um, hence rendering them the stuff of only museums. And it's not as if Constant was averse to showing a museum, that's clearly one medium where he could uh, produce his work, show, demonstrate his work, but he always had this ambition to go beyond such spaces. On the other hand, viewed from another angle, it might seem that they've become only too successful, incorporated by the capitalist society that they so strongly opposed. For doesn't it 
perhaps seem that many of Constant's ideals, his assaults on the rigidity of urban planning, uh, his demands for perpetual creative play, this vision of fluid spaces and so on, um, they might seem to have arrived, but in a very perverse form, through the rhetoric of creative cities, this demand by the culture industry to constantly create ourselves as a project and our work as projects. Where creative, being creative is an imperative, um, a matter of work and survival. The writer Christopher Drury, writing about um, the demands for creative cities, talks about creative, be creative or die as the imperative facing cities as they compete for elements of the creative class. And in a recent discussion of New Babylon, um, the architect Rem Kohlhaas, um, referring to this exhibition currently at The Hague, acknowledges the significance of Constance aesthetic for his own work, um, but notes, as he puts it, the dreadful analogies between today's city marketing and situationism. And with respect to the marketization of play and creativity, he writes, he says, um, what was once launched as an authentic aspiration has now degenerated into a kitsch aesthetic performance. And also, perhaps not surprisingly, this kind of tone often accompanies recent displays of Constance's work. In one of the last major exhibitions before this one, which was in Rotterdam in 1999, the um, director of the institution involved, Bertram Murray, referred to it as probably the last attempt in European art to provide a global revolutionary image of and place for society. And he asked then, why did the century which began so full of intentions to change the world end with the total absence of such perspectives? And certainly there's been much talk in recent decades, well beyond the realms of art, about political and cultural horizons closing, about various kinds of endings. Think of the end of ideology, the end of modernism, the end of the avant-garde, of history, and so on. And utopia has often been declared dead in this context. Emblematic of this is that the often referenced difficulty of imagining, let alone immobilizing, hopefully around, alternatives to contemporary capitalism. What the cultural critic Mark Fisher calls a kind of capitalist realism seems to reign. And um, it's a, a sort of a position which is perhaps most effectively summed up by a, a line which is often quoted and attributed to Frederick Jameson where he says it's become easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Or actually what he put was the thoroughgoing deterioration of the earth and of nature than the breakdown of late capitalism. And this sense then of, of no alternative is instantiated, we might suggest, by the very physical fabric of our cities in many ways. This feeling that the city in its apparent solidity seems to embody this feeling that there's no alternative to the neoliberal dominant mode. This idea of cities made for business, the right to the city that's predominant is, seems to be the right of those who make the city in terms of a kind of business interest. Um, so in this sense, it's really where I wanted, want to leave off, is just this opening up really of questions about the contemporary role of artistic practices, the continuing utopian ambitions despite these claims of the death of utopia that inform a whole variety of actions. And we might think here of the resonances and, and the kind of reawakening of interest in some of these early histories through the Occupy movements, for instance. And it's not surprising, I think, that the political imaginary of the Commune of 1871 has seemed to resonate again amongst, in the wake of 2011. Ideas of social life in terms of cooperation, um, association, questionings of hierarchies, different forms of organizing and mobilization, and so on. Um, and when we might also think then of the ways in which a whole variety of practices are less perhaps about kind of representing um, the outlines of a new world, which was one of Constance's ambitions, but perhaps giving us glimpses of what that might feel like in the present moment, of opening up gaps and cracks of drawing our attention to contradictions within the capitalist city, which might be levered or might provide, might be prized open by uh, movements as well as those working within the visual arts and um, artistic practice. But as I say, I want to leave time for.